Okay, so today uh, we're going to do a conditional patterning tutorial here in Grasshopper. It should be pretty fast. Uh, the idea is that we're going to use um, some logical tests, uh, in this case a greater than test, to dispatch um, two, two lists, one of which will create a simple component with an aperture in it that we'll have individual control over, and a second list which will create another component which has a kind of range of variables based on distance to an attractor point. So this is, I think it's somewhat similar to the parametric trust tutorial where we looked at um, an attractor point. Uh, it's a little different here in that we're um, we're using dispatch to kind of separate two lists. So um, let's get started. I'm going to start with a brand new Grasshopper file. And the first thing we'll do is try to generate um, a grid of hexagonal curves, a, uh, an attractor point that we can move around with this little uh, multi-dimensional slider that will um, kind of generate distances that we can work on here with a test. So new document and we'll start with a, a hex grid. This is found in vector grids. Uh, there's a hexagonal grid right here at the top. Um, I'll hover over just to see what we're working with. It wants to know what the base plane for the grid is the size of the hexagon radius, and the number of cells in both directions. So I want to work on the ZX plane here, kind of in a wall configuration. So in plane, I can find the, uh, the XZ plane. That'll be our base plane. Um, the size of the radius we can control with slider. Uh, so I'll just initialize a slider to um, f like five, and we'll use decimal points here. Uh, so we have kind of a fine control over the slider. As you can see, we're already generating some of these because uh, there are default values here for um, the number of cells in the x and y direction. So let's just get one more number slider here, and this one will set to 20 or so. And I'm going to set the bounds between 1 and like 30, just so we can get a pretty large uh, grid if we want to, and we'll never end up with a, a zero-sized one. And I'll copy and paste this one, and this will control a number of cells in X and Y. So now I can control how many, um, how many cells we get in both dimensions and the size of all of the cells in the grid. <laughs> so if we look at what we've got here, um, basically we're going to have a big data tree of curves coming out of the curve component. And this will either be a, um, a list of each branch is either a column or a row. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. But we're going to flatten this anyway, because we're just going to be treating this as a big list of um, curves. So the next thing we'll need to do, uh, since we want to be measuring distances between the center points of each of these to an attractor point, is to create that attractor point. So you could do this as, um, as just a point in Rhino. That's what we did in class, just to uh, kind of keep it, keep it simple. But in this example, I'm going to use a, a multi-dimensional slider, very similar to the example we did in the parametric truss. So this is right here, a multi-dimensional slider. And this is going to give me um, a set of UV coordinates um, on a plane. So we'll need a planar surface that's about as big as our grid of curves. So, you know, there's lots of ways to do this. The kind of quick and dirty way I'm going to do today, we're just going to, um, in surface, create a, a plane 
plane surface. Uh, the plane we'll be working on, the surface base plane, is the same one, that XZ plane. And for the sizes, we want to use the, you know, the same set of driving sliders to control these sizes. And since the, um, you know, the size of the hexagon radius, you know, I'm not sure whether this it goes to the the inside or the outside of the hexagon. Um, I just, I did a little multiplication here to get a surface that's about the same size, which will be close enough for our purposes. So since we're dealing with a radius, we'll have to multiply everything by 2. So that'll be our first step, is saying that the the slider we're using for the radius will be multiplied by 2, and then that result will be multiplied by these two sliders to give us our x and y dimensions. So um, we'll just need another multiplication component here, and we'll do this result as a in both cases, and then the b's are going to be our two sliders. So we should be able to plug those right into x and y, and it looks a little big, um, and I think the way I got around this was just changing this multiplier until it was kind of close. So let's just call that close enough. This should, uh, you know, stay about the same size. And we can hide that. So just like the the attractor example we did will will evaluate that planar surface and use the um, use this multi-dimensional slider to specify a UV point. So surface analysis evaluate. The surface we want to evaluate is that planar surface that we just made. And the UV point we'll look at is the point we're making with our slider. So you can see, it's a little tough to see actually, but uh, we are getting a point down here and a plane. Um, we'll have to right click and reparameterize this whole surface. So now since we're, we kind of shifted the domain between 0 and 1, that attractor point will live a you know, kind of in the same domain as our grid, no matter how big or how small it gets. So now we can, um, the other output from the hex grid is um, all the points, but that's not exactly what we want. We want to get the, we want to measure from the center of each cell to the attractor point. So let's do a quick area calculation, surface analysis area which will give us all of the centroids. And we'll do a distance measurement. Um, let's get it out of the panel. Vector, um, I think point distance is where I found that. You could also just double click and type distance. So the two points that we're measuring between first point and second point are all of the centroids will be our first point, our list of first points. Our second point will be that cent the, our UV point that we got. And now we should end up with a large list of distances. And of course, you know, the, the length of this list will be equal to the number of uh, cells that we have. So now we're ready to um, do our test. We're basically going to just do a numerical test with, um, with these outputs to dispatch this list of curves into two branches. So since I don't know, you know, the, the size of all these distances depends on um, all of my slider variables, I'm going to uh, bound these or remap the, all these distances between 0 and 1. Um, this should all be pretty familiar, but just to review, we'll start with the remap numbers uh, component out of math domain. The values we want to remap are all of these distances. The source domain will find with the bounds component out of domain, uh, the domain section there. 
and the target domain will leave at 0 to 1. So now we should be ready, uh, again I'm in math operators, we should be able to perform a, a larger than test um, between all of these remapped numbers and just a simple slider that will, you know, range between 0 and 1. So the output of this will be a list of Boolean values, true-false values. So we haven't really worked with this, uh, this type of data too much before. Um, basically, this little greater than component performs a test. It asks, is this first number A greater than this number B? If it is, it will return true. Um, if it's not, it will t return false. So we can you know, reasonably simply look at this and hopefully get some, get some results. Maybe if we go to a very small or very large number. Um, so here the first value in the list is 0.953, which is greater than 0.890, so we get a true. The second value is 0.872, which is less than 0.890, so we get a false. So we're almost done here with the, the testing. Um, the only thing we need to do now is dispatch the list. So now we have our true-false map. And if we go to sets list dispatch, we can take any list of data and um, dispatch it based on a Boolean pattern. So you can see it has a true-false value set by default, but we're going to use our big list of trues and falses that we just generated to dispatch the list of curves. So now if I, um, if I kind of hide everything upstream and just grab two curve components, I should be able to see the difference uh, between these two sets. And I'll just select um, one, the ones that fail the test. They're less than this number. So as I decrease the slider value, you should see these values get smaller and smaller and eventually go to one single cell here in the viewport. And if I put it at a kind of middle of the road position, I should be able to watch those cells move when I uh, change the location of the attractor point. So, so far so good. We just have, we've performed uh, a very simple test and we've created two lists of curves. One list that passes the test, one list that fails the test. So now we can take these two lists and we're just going to build two very simple um, little components, surface components. Uh, you'll remember from the demo, the ones inside of the the ones that failed the test, the ones that are close to the attractor point, will have a single, uh, uh, an aperture, a circular aperture that's driven by a single slider. And all the red ones here, the ones that pass the test, will have an aperture that uh, ranges from a large, you know, one value to another based on distance to the original attractor point. So let's start with uh, the simple one first. Let's start with just the single surface. We have all these curves, um, and we already found their centroids, but I think it'll just be simpler to do it again here. We could dispatch those the same way we did the curves. But I'll just create some new uh, center points, and that surface area will give us the centroids. We will draw a circle on each one of those points and we'll use the, the circle component which draws a circle on a plane. Uh, right now it's such the world xy plane by default and we, we will just take, since we're working on the zx plane, I'll grab just another uh, xz component and the origin for all those planes uh, will be all of the centroids. So that can be our um, all of our planes, and we'll just do a single 
uh, single radius for all these. And I'll just copy this slider, uh, the one that I'm using to set the, the radius of all the hexagons, since I know they'll be about the same size. It'll have to be a little bit smaller. So there we go. Now we have circles at each one of these um, centroids. And of course, when I change the, the kind of cutoff distance, we'll get more circles or fewer. And now we're just going to loft the, the hexagon to the circle. Uh, excuse me, we're going to join those and create a planar surface very similar to the parametric truss component. So I'll do the same thing. I'll merge these. And I imagine I'll have to, um, to graft and simplify these just to make sure that they're on the same list. Uh, you can see here we have a path that's three dimensions deep and three dimensions deep. So I shouldn't have to simplify these. I should just be able to join them. Join all those curves. It'll join the curves in each list. We'll have lists of two, as you can see there. And now I should be able to make a planar surface. Perfect. So now if I just hide these, uh, I should be able to change my cutoff distance and we'll make more or less planar surfaces and we'll have control over that circular aperture in the middle of those. So that's our first component. Now the second one, the one we want to make out here, uh, ranges from one size to another based on distance. So in this case we'll need all of those original distances. Um, but we can't use all of them because there's 180 in this list and some number that's going to be smaller than 180 curves. So I'm going to just copy and paste the dispatch component. And in this case, what we want to dispatch is the distances, not the curves. Um, and we're only going to be working with the A branch. And you know what? I think I actually want to dispatch the, the remapped results, um, not the, yeah, I want to remap these guys so I can just work between 0 and 1 again instead of having to work with unknown distances. All right, so the next thing we'll do, uh, it'll be pretty similar to the last one. Uh, we can, in fact, just take some of this. We'll take the centroids. Uh, we'll make XY planes at all those centroids and draw circles at those planes. Um, I'll hide the planes just to make it a little easier to see. But in this case, we don't want a single slider driving all these. We want a range between two numbers. So um, we'll do this very, again, very similar to the parametric truss. We'll just create an upper and a lower uh, bound for these and we'll, we'll do a little remapping again. Um, in this case our source domain should be between 0 and 1 so let's just let's grab the remap numbers component. Um, the values we want to remap are all of these distance numbers the source domain will be between 0 and 1, that's fine. And in this case, the target domain, we're going to set between these two numbers. So we'll create a domain between two extremes, and that will be the, the target domain. So now we should get a bunch of results that are between these two numbers, and we'll pass those into the circles. Um, so you can kind of see it there. We're getting large circles close to the attractor point and small circles far away from it. So far, so good. So we'll do the exact same thing. Uh, and in fact, we can just copy all of this. And now we'll, the curves that we're using are our dispatched A curves. Our circles are the ones that we just drew. And looks like we're We've got a working definition now. So I'm just going to hide 
everything we've done so far and we'll just create a little render component uh, shader and we'll create a very simple material I'll create um, I suppose I'll do two of these just so we can select them and maybe I'll uh, do the same material for both so I'm just flattening everything just so it's nice and light We've got our nice hot pink color by default um, vector color material will give us a material that supports translucency and we'll just do white with a little translucency in it that'll be the material for both sliders or for both shaders and uh, we should be all set here so let's just review what we've got we've got a variable grid of uh, hexagonal components here and we can control the aperture size of the components that are close to an attractor and the range of apertures of all the components that are not close to the contract attractor point. Furthermore, we can specify that cutoff distance to the attractor point where we switch between one component and the other and we have the ability to move that attractor point around kind of inside of the bounds of the surface. So I think that's that's about where I wanted to get today. I hope the I hope you can all find ways to apply the same kind of diagram to your uh, your work. Um, you know, just to review, basically all we did was took a big flat list of curves, perform a very simple test, a logical test, and dispatched the results into two streams, uh, and we basically just created two components that um, we can pass variable amounts of inputs to. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the most common ways to work in Grasshopper uh, and the, the ability to do these um, logical tests is what I think sets apart Grasshopper from a lot of other parametric packages out there and in fact it starts to get closer to rule-based design, right? Because now we're, we're setting up a simple rule and based on whether or not the geometry follows that rule or not, we can, we can act on the results. So that's it. If there are any questions, please post them in the comments and uh, we'll pick it up again next week.